Hello, this is Mr. Fredericks, and we are going to do a screencast on the Montgomery bus boycott, the protest that some people believe started the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement, which of course is going to be kind of the birth of Martin Luther King into fame, and that's going to have a, a real tangible impact. Now, it wasn't that people didn't fight for justice before that. One could argue, and historians do, that most of these fights were for nothing. They weren't successful. There was less impact whereas this movement is going to achieve a very high level of success. Not complete success, but significant amount of success. So we're going to talk about that beginning, the Montgomery bus boycott, and let us, uh, let, let us go. So that said, in order to tell any story, you need to go back to kind of uh, the root origins, and we're going to go back to 1896. In 1896, a guy by the name of Homer Plessy, who was more than 90% white and looked very white, but partially African-American says, you know what? I am against segregation. I don't think segregation's right. And he's going to conduct a little protest. He's going to go on a train that had a white car and a black car. And the black car, African-American car was very, very low standard. And the white car was advanced and amazing. And it was just an example of inequity, right? How segregation was not equitable. He looks white, even though he's technically by law classified as black because he's partially black goes into the white car. He is violating the segregation law when he does it. He announces that he's actually part African-American and he gets arrested. Now he sues, and that's what you do when you get arrested under a law that you think is violating the constitution, you sue. And in his case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And it's gonna be very, very, very famous in 1896 called Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson is when Homer Plessy argued, and his lawyer, of course, that uh, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution says that everybody has to be treated equally before the law. You can have different laws for different people. Everybody has to be equal. And ultimately, Plessy uh, Reed Ferguson was an argument about whether that train car, having a white car and a black car, violated that equi equ equity clause of the 14th Amendment, equality clause. You know, his argument was that those trains weren't equal, and therefore it was a violation of the 14th Amendment, and therefore segregation needed to go bye-bye. Well, anyway, um, that was his argument, and he's going to lose. The Supreme Court does not agree with him. Uh, we can probably imagine why in 1896, not the most progressive in race terms, people on the Supreme Court. But anyway, their argument of the Supreme Court at the time was, no, 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 no. The 14th Amendment does guarantee that we treat people the same, but in theory, we can separate white and black people and still treat them the same, just in different places. So therefore, segregation does not automatically violate the 14th Amendment, and therefore we can keep it. So that was the ruling. Plessy v. Ferguson. He loses. Fast forward all the way to 1954. That's one year before the Montgomery bus boycott. The Supreme Court has another case called Brown v. Board of Education, one of the most famous Supreme Court cases. And it is going to overrule Plessy v. Ferguson at least a little bit, uh, but only in terms of schools. There's In the Brown v. Board of Education, the lawyer is going to prove that having separate schools, particularly schools that are quite inferior for African Americans, is going to significantly hurt the psychology and well-being, mental well-being of African American students, and therefore violates the 14th Amendment. So segregation in schools, at least, needs to go bye-bye. It's a violation of the 14th Amendment. It is a direct disagreement with Plessy v. Ferguson from like 60 years before. So segregation in schools is gone. As of 1954, the Supreme Court orders this. It's going to take a little while to happen, but at least the ball is starting to roll. However, segregation, even though if it's on its way out in schools, kind of, segregation still exists everywhere else. Brown v. Board of Education didn't deal with segregation in any other context. In the South, hotels are still segregated, restaurants, water fountains, offices, parks, you name it. Everything is segregated, or many things. It's a little different state to state. An additional example where segregation still exists, even after Brown v. Board of Education, is in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, the capital of Alabama. Uh, they're going to have Jim Crow laws, um, you know, all across the South and especially the Deep South that segregate buses. And that is going to be at the heart of our problem for the Montgomery bus boycott. Segregation on buses. In Montgomery, buses had 10 back seats that were reserved for African Americans only, 10 front seats reserved for white Americans. And you could argue that that would comply with the 14th Amendment um, as interpreted at that time. But where they got into complicated moments was the unreserved seats in the middle. Buses were bigger than 20 seats. And those unreserved seats it right away might seem equal because anybody could sit there, but it wasn't that at all. Um, so what, um, what African-American leaders of Montgomery complained about and why they later sued was they said these were condescending policies that did violate the 14th Amendment. That African-Americans were never hired as drivers, not a single driver. Um, if white seats filled up those 10 in the front, then the middle seats became white. 
and the bus drivers wouldn't let African Americans sit there. That wasn't equal. African Americans um, could be standing over empty seats because let's say there's four seats or six to a row in that middle and just one white person needed one of those seats. The others had to remain empty. You couldn't mix white and black. So they'd rather African Americans were standing and couldn't sit down even if there were open seats in the middle. So that was not good. Uh, minimal stops were in African American communities. If you've ever had to take a bus, having to walk a mile or two miles just to get to a bus stop uh, is not something anybody enjoys. It impacts every aspect of your life. Whereas there were so many stops in white neighborhoods that people could almost go right outside their homes and get on a bus. Um, there are stories that you'd have to pay up front, particularly as an African-American rider, and then you'd have to enter from the back. So you'd have to leave the bus again. You weren't allowed to walk through the white section, which was very demeaning and awful. Uh, and a lot of times bus drivers were, were told that they would just let the African-American riders pay and then they would take off. And that was an awful story, right? So a lot of times those African-Americans were left stranded after paying. Uh, bus drivers were abusive with their behavior and their language, treating African-Americans certainly inequitably. Uh, that 14th Amendment was supposed to protect and stop these things, but it wasn't. So 1955, tensions were rising after Brown v. Board of ed Education. The South felt under attack by the federal government. They, they believed that segregation was a state issue, that they should have the right. The federal government shouldn't violate their freedom by trying to end segregation. So the South was already angry. They were ready to fight, poised to fight, so to speak. But also the Emmett Till murder lynching also got African-Americans to be angry and ready to fight. Millions of African Americans pissed off about this murder and nothing had come from it, right? The two got away with it. So uh, we basically have two groups here ready to fight, almost like a racial war. Now, on December 1st, 1955, um, a seamstress living in Montgomery, Alabama, her name is Rosa Parks, after um, a long, tired day of working as a seamstress and even as a secretary, that was her second job, she enters a bus to finally go home. And it's at this spot where that occurred. There's even uh, the bus itself is in a museum in Montgomery. And so she sat in the first unreserved row. She didn't seat and sit in the white section. She sat in the unreserved section. And if you can see this kind of model here, that's where she was um, and so on. So that said, um, additional white passengers suddenly got on at that stop. And, that, and the driver, uh, James Blake, basically said, you need to get up and give up those seats for the white um, passengers that had just walked on. A group of African-American riders got up, but Rosa Parks stayed. She did not comply. She did not stay there. She said that Emmett Till was on her mind. She had just at her church had somebody come from Mississippi talking to them about the Emmett Till murder, and she was pissed off and angry, and she says she was just tired. She was tired of this racism, tired of not fighting back. She wasn't getting up. So she got arrested, and there she is with her mug shots. And she was also a secretary for the NAACP, which is the oldest civil rights organization in the country, even to this day, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And that was the group of people that were ready to fight. So that said, they started, the NAACP was already looking at this law, the segregation law, and saying it violated the 14th Amendment. And they wanted to sue and basically say that Montgomery was violating the 14th Amendment, not treating African Americans equally. But you can't sue and try to overturn a law unless you have what's called legal standing. Standing means you've been hurt by a law, and then you can sue. Not, you can't just sue government any time over law. You have to prove the law hurt you. That's standing. And of course, now they had Rosa Parks um, get arrested and lost her freedom, and that's standing. So they are going to try to sue through Rosa Parks and, um, and whatnot. Um, now, that said... This is going to be the beginning of, uh, they need a leader to try to, they, they, I'm sorry, the Montgomery bus boycott was kind of a two-prong attack. They were gonna sue through the Rosa Parks case, but they were also going to do a boycott. Um, and that economic boycott was meant to put pressure on Montgomery so that they would lose money and voluntarily get rid of this racist policy that violated the 14th Amendment. So on December 5th, 1955, on Rosa Parks' day in court, when she was gonna get arraigned, um, remember, the number one uh, the number one piece of this attack was Joanne Robinson basically decided to fight back. They were upset that Rosa Parks was getting arrested. And she organized a one-day boycott. If you're going to treat us this badly on the buses again, then we African Americans are not going to go on the buses. And when tens of thousands of us don't go on the buses, then you're going to lose a massive amount of money because of your stupid policy. So stop being racist and stupid and undo this. And that was the one-day boycott, a show of solidarity. This was the letter that uh, Robinson had written to everybody. Um, if we read this together, 
Um, I, I made it a little bit shorter. Another woman has been arrested and thrown in jail because she refused to get up out of her seat on the bus for a white person to sit down. This has to be stopped. Negroes have rights too. The next time it may be you or your daughter or your mother. Don't ride the buses to work, to town, to school, or anywhere on Monday. You can afford to stay out of school for one day. Please stay off the buses Monday. So that was what she sent home with all the school and military children. After all, we couldn't communicate through phones at that time. And on that one day, uh, tens of thousands of African Americans of Montgomery um, are going to um, stay off the buses, which in theory is going to cost thousands and thousands of dollars to Montgomery. As a show of solidarity, as you can see, this was a huge movement of protests, people walking and biking and so on. It was so unbelievably successful that suddenly the leaders of that one day boycott had a big decision to make. They, uh, so often when African-Americans fought against a much stronger racist white society, they often lost. Here it seemed like they won. They did a sign of solidarity, everybody stuck together. They sent a message, they cost the racist system money. So they said, why don't we just keep doing this until they actually change this? So they formed a new group called the Montgomery Improvement Association and they would manage the boycott to go from one day until basically the changes were made so that the racist policies would end on the buses. Now you need a leader to form this big of a movement. And at that time, they found a very young new preacher just moved to Montgomery named Martin Luther King. He seemed really smart, intelligent, and charismatic, organized and like he could basically lead a movement. And that was the deal. So they picked a young Martin Luther King, nobody knew who he was and so on. So at this point, Hundreds of years have gone by with minimal progress, and people would learn not to, you know, to, to give up, not to fight, to fail. So why is the Montgomery bus boycott going to be so successful? Well, under the leader of Martin Luther King, we're going to find out right now. So why is this successful? Well, number one, African Americans made up two-thirds of the riders in the bus. That gave them economic power. If they don't ride the buses, that costs the city money. You do that long enough, the city loses tens of thousands of dollars. They can't function. They can't pay their workers, and, may, and then they will voluntarily get rid of their policy. So that's why a boycott is so successful. It costs Montgomery money, right? And there's a picture of the, those buses being virtually empty. Next, that economic pressure, also in addition to that, if people aren't riding the buses, they're also told not to go downtown. And if they don't go downtown, they're not spending money at any of these segregated businesses. And if those segregated businesses don't have anybody spending money there, they're gonna lose so much money, they're going to go out of business. And those are very powerful people, business owners. They can put pressure on the government to end the racist policy of segregation on those buses. Now, however, success comes at a cost. There is sacrifice. Walking miles to work, whether it's 5, 10, or 15, is really, really hard to do twice a day, never mind for an entire year straight. This is going to be a huge sacrifice on the people of Montgomery, the African Americans in Montgomery. It's a challenging time, whether it's rain or terrible weather. Now, the walkers did get some help. People knew that for this to work, they had to organize some support. So they organized rolling churches, African-Americans that had cars, or particularly churches did. They would constantly ferry people back and forth to their jobs, and that was their full-time job. Uh, African-American owned taxis started charging a dime, which was the bus fare, they weren't, and so they had to give up a ton of money, and they would start ferrying people back and forth to their jobs. Now, was there any pushback to this? Um, now, there was a group called the White Citizens Council that was basically made up of all the white business owners of Montgomery. And their job was to go against this movement and do whatever it took to end it um, and so on. So what did they do? Uh, the white insurance company stopped, canceled the insurance of any African-American drivers that were part of the movement. That would teach them to help people to get to and fro work. The city fined black taxi drivers by made up various uh, citations that they made, that they, they did. Uh, very, violation of laws, even fake laws. King's house, which is, this is where he lived. Somebody bombed it, and that's a, a picture after the bomb. You can even still go to the remade house there and see the bomb crater right on the steps. Uh, they didn't remake that concrete. Four black churches were firebombed because these were, tend to be where the meetings were held for African Americans to handle the boycott. Imagine a world where people stay off buses and in retaliation, people bomb and attack churches. Now, the leaders were all arrested and indicted under old antiquated laws, any laws they could find. There were 88 arrests of all the leaders. And of course, the White Citizens Council and the white leaders of Montgomery were like, ha, huh, we'll throw them in jail. That will scare them. That will end this boycott. It actually had an unintended consequence, right? You know, um, basically, you think hurting somebody it makes them weaker. 
but you can argue that this backfired. It actually, when you arrest 88 people, it got national attention. That's a really big deal, 88 people getting arrested. So suddenly reporters from all around the country and world were hearing about this. They came to Montgomery to cover it and give it more attention. And of course, that's the key to civil disobedience, right? You make some noise, people hear about it, they cannot talk about it, and then millions of people can join your movement and support you. And that's kind of what happened here. So that said, that movement's going to gain a ton of power. And again, that is that lesson, get people's attention. So does the boycott actually work? Well, a year passes and there's still no victory. Now, at least a tangible victory. Montgomery hasn't given in. You could argue that there are millions of more supporters and they're donating money to the cause and you're uniting the African-American community to get, get them ready to fight over this. And when people are united, they're willing to fight harder and all these things. So you can argue that judges across the country have seen this and maybe they're, now they feel sympathy for the movement and that's gonna help them rule in cases but still Montgomery has not gotten rid of segregation. So another plan is needed besides the economic boycott and staying off the buses. So the lawsuit that we talked about a while ago, remember Rosa Parks got arrested and some other people got arrested. Well, they used those arrests to sue and say that this violated the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment says everybody has to be equal and these and the buses did not treat African-Americans equally in Montgomery. So November 13th, 1956, in a very famous case, Browder v. Gale, it basically was a case that ran parallel to the Rosa Parks case. Um, the courts heard this and they declared, yes, we agree. Montgomery is violating the 14th Amendment. This is not an equal treatment of African-Americans on these buses. And Montgomery, you have to stop segregating your buses, get rid of it. So on December 20th, 1956, that court ordered that buses in Montgomery needed to be desegregated. And that is going to be the victory. Now, can you argue that that boycott and all the fame that was created, all that attention influenced those judges to make the decision? I would say yes. So again, this two-prong attack worked. Integration is achieved. There's a picture of Martin Luther King in the middle and of course the other leaders of the movement being like, we won. It only took a year and there's a lot more battles to fight, but we won this. And this is an image of Martin Luther King and a few um, and a number of other supporters sitting on the front of that bus um, immediately on that first day. And there's Rosa Parks doing the same thing sitting on the front of the bus celebrating that victory. So now there are some forgotten aspects of the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, somebody did after this fire a shotgun through Martin Luther King's front door. Now you have to remember he had young children. It's a really big deal. Um, two buses were fired on by snipers. Five black churches eventually were bombed. Rosa Parks faced so much harassment and violence that she left Montgomery for the rest of her life due to death threats. Uh, by 1963, um, one could argue that most African Americans voluntarily rode on the back of the bus, although some would say that was voluntarily and more, um, and therefore was not a big deal. The rights were still achieved. Now, the legacy of the Montgomery bus boycott was um, that number one, it raised awareness. So, if we're talking about why this mattered, it raised awareness. All eyes were on Southern racism, and when people know about something, now they can join the fight, right? Um, so, people were paying attention to Southern racist practices. Number two, um, people can get used to anything. Uh, white people, uh, Southern white racists can get used to treating African-Americans badly, not even realize they're doing it. African-Americans can get used to that poor treatment. But this woke people up and saying, this is not fair. This is not okay. We can fight. We need to fight. So um, any African-American that has self-respect has to fight. So some people say that, you know, when you lose so many times, you give up hope. This was a victory. And when you have a victory, people get uh, people get powerful, they get confident, they get motivated to keep fighting. So you can argue that African-Americans in the South gained self-respect and motivation to keep fighting after this. And that's going to have the domino effect leading to hundreds of protests, which are going to result in, you know, further protests like the Little Rock Nine, the James Meredith protests, the Freedom Rides, the Freedom Summer, the Albany Movement, the Birmingham protests, the Selma protests, and so many more. Number three, this did raise hope and expectations, right? Which, of course, is going to lead to those same issues. It's going to create national awareness, self-respect, hope, and ultimately in 1957, it's going to result in a new leader to be born. Martin Luther King is now going to be famous. He's going to be supported by so many people. People are going to follow him. They're going to see him as the leader of the civil rights movement, and he's going to found an organization after the Montgomery bus boycott, Montgomery bus boycott called SCLC, SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It's then going to become essentially an organization after they hold the conference, SCLC is going to be the most powerful civil rights organization, them and NAACP, and they're going to fight so many battles that ultimately are going to result in huge successes for this movement, Martin Luther King being its president. 
So without the Montgomery bus boycott, you wouldn't have had SCLC or Martin Luther King, most likely, and then you might not have had a successful civil rights movement. So SCLC is so important uh, because one of the major reasons the civil rights movement is gonna be so successful is because of its nonviolent Christian influence. A lot of times if the civil rights movement became violent, you could argue that uh, it would not have gained white support and it was that white support that quickly allowed in the 1960s for so many laws to pass that in some ways overturned those racist policies. And so that Christian influence from Martin Luther King and SCLC that came from Montgomery is going to really turn the civil rights movement into a very positive nonviolent movement. And that's gonna be important for its success. So um, its greatest legacy is that it is the spark. The Montgomery bus boycott is gonna create a spark of hundreds of other protests. And that's gonna be the modern day civil rights movement with all of its glory and victory. So that the importance of this first victory cannot go overstated. It's gonna to lead to that civil rights movement. So um, this is just a brief overview of the Montgomery bus boycott. Like I said, there are so many protests that follow it and we will look into those major protests and other screencasts. Thank you so much and enjoy your day.